Great. So, hey there. I'm going to talk about keeping Pebble devices alive many years after the original company had died. <laughs> so, first off, what was Pebble? Pebble made smartwatches similar to Apple's Apple Watch or Google's Wear OS, but a few years earlier. They were originally funded on Kickstarter, which led to them gaining a more hacker-focused community. It also happens that I once worked at this company, which is perhaps related to how I ended up here. <laughs> So, what happened to Pebble? Well, it ran out of money and had to shut down. Fitbit bought the remnants of the company and promised to keep things going for a while, but it was pretty clear that everything would eventually fall apart. But because Pebble had gained something of a hacker focus, and because it had a different philosophy to most of its competition about what a smartwatch should be, it had amassed a somewhat impressive community of users and developers, and they weren't willing to just let it die. Developers began congregating in what had once been known as the uh, Pebble Developers Discord server and schemed to keep it alive. There was reverse engineering for Pebble App Store, mirroring of all of Pebble's websites, and plots underway to re-implement the web services and even build custom firmware that could still be updated and to run on the watches. Some people went as far as working on new hardware. <laughs> and some of them are here. So a year went by, the original shutdown date came and went, and Fitbit silently kept Pebble services running because it was more effort to not do that. <laughs> As things kept running, people slowly lost interest in most parts of this rebirth project, and then Fitbit announced that Pebble was finally going to go down on July 1st of that year, and people should buy a Fitbit instead. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people were just as thrilled by that option in 2018 as they had been in 2017. But unfortunately, most of the work had never actually gotten done. <laughs> so what would we lose if we just let everything disappear? As it turns out, Pebble relied on a whole host of web services, which meant a lot of stuff was set to break when the servers turned off. There was an app store, which you also needed if you wanted to keep having the apps you already had once your watch reset. There were language packs to switch languages, dictation to talk to your watch, a weather app, timeline pins, and so forth. Not all of this would necessarily actually break, or at least not in ways that were immediately noticeable, because Fitbit updated the apps once more to enable a limited degree of offline functionality. But in practice, that really only got you as far as being able to turn the watches on, and a lot of other things were still going to break. This is where I, quite accidentally, became an active member of this story, instead of just having been watching for most of the time. One of the services that Pebble ran was an open source web-based IDE called Cloud Pebble, which I had originally built before they hired me. Using the old official Cloud Pebble account, which for some reason I still controlled, <laughs> I tweeted an offer to keep Cloud Pebble running, which wouldn't be terribly hard in theory because it was an open source program that I had written in the first place. However, this was broadly misinterpreted as meaning all of Pebble's cloud services. And I must admit, in retrospect, I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> but I was loath to disappoint everyone, and so a few days later, alongside some still active revelers like Joshua Wise and I Shot JR, whose name I had to ask about pronouncing, <laughs> we announced for Rebel Web Services, and also for legal reasons formed the Rebel Alliance LLC. <laughs> <laughs> A real company that actually exists. <laughs> but even if we were to re-implement everything, how could we make anything use it? In the absence of anything else, the apps will sk still keep trying to talk to the server that no longer exists. Conveniently, as a debugging tool, the Pebble apps used what we called the boot server to look up the URL of every service they would ever hit. Change those URLs, and you can point the app anywhere you like. Even more conveniently, the apps had a custom URL scheme, and if you hit that, they would switch over to use your boot server of choice. We originally built this so we could switch to the staging environment, but it turns out to be super useful in general. <laughs> and also a critical security flaw. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we go about building a bunch of APIs to make all these apps happy? 
we reverse engineer them, which in practice meant that I spent a lot of time staring at MIT mProxy, poking at the app to try and figure out what it was doing, because I had mostly forgotten in the two years since I had last touched any of this. <laughs> um, and of course, once we've built things, we have to run them somewhere. We don't really know how many users we'll have, we don't know how we're going to pay for it, and we are a bunch of clueless software engineers who don't really know how to run reliable services. So what are we going to do? We'll fall back on the buzzword of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so Rebel web, Re <laughs> Rebel web Services, for the most part, runs on AWS Lambda, serves its files from S3, and has no servers that I have to think about, which is pretty great for me. <laughs> Another exciting question we had while trying to build these things is to figure out what our scale might be. I figure there probably aren't that many active Pebble users around, and they'll only use us if they happen to hear about us from Reddit or something. So maybe a thousand tops seems easy enough. Well, then there were some news articles. <laughs> and some more news articles. And even more. And this one <laughs> isn't even a text site. <laughs> So, 100,000 users then. <laughs> this is how many we actually have today. <laughs> so having built our infrastructure to serve 1,000 users, we actually have 100,000 users. <laughs> but it was OK. Our serverless servers automatically scaled up, so we had a whole bunch of our concurrent non-instances, and everything was good. <laughs> This worked so well, in fact, that I didn't even realize it had happened until I checked about two months later. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we pay for all of this? <laughs> We're running a whole bunch of our non-servers and have to keep databases up somewhere, and that's before we even start thinking about API costs. We want to ensure this keeps running for as long as possible, as long as anyone wants to use it, which means we don't want to be dependent on, for instance, paying out of our own pocket or making everyone pay. So step one, make a budget, part of which you can see here. I figured roughly what we would cost per user across all our services with a whole bunch of variables for changing assumptions, most of which are numbers I plucked out of the air with no real justification. <laughs> All of them, of course, assumed orders of magnitude fewer users than we actually had. <laughs> but servers turn out not to matter. The real costs would be API access. Assuming 100,000 users, that would be $220,000 a year to Google for dictation and $520,000 a year to IBM for weather. Paying three quarters of a million dollars a year out of pocket is not sustainable, <laughs> to say the least. I don't have that much money. But it does perhaps suggest a strategy for a sustainable solution. We'll make you pay if you want to use the APIs, and only if you want to use the APIs. Using our budget and making more wild assumptions, I figured that if I charged users $3 a month for weather and dictation, the minority of users who paid for it would cover their own costs and also subsidize the other users. It turns out I was right, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually requiring you have a subscription, of course, turns out to be tricky because Pebble didn't tell us who you were when it looked up for weather or when it, you sent dictation because it didn't care, but we do. We can, however, control the URLs for those services. So I guess we'll just stuff the authentication into the URLs. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a pain too, because the boot server doesn't have authentication either. So it's time for crazy hacks. What we are instead going to do is stuff authentication into the boot URL we give the app. Since we need to make you click a magic link on your phone anyway, we make you log in first and stuff a magic link in there. So you have your authentication token in your URLs, which then sticks it into other URLs, some of which actually have to go in DNS because we couldn't change the path, which is extra fun and also super secure. <laughs> <laughs> but it all works. So there's plenty more I could say, but I don't have the time to say it. So find me later if you'd like to talk more about this. But I'd like to wrap up by mentioning just a few of the people who continue to make this work, whose names I will mostly not try pronouncing. Between them and many others, they are handling tasks like administration, 
firmware and even hardware development, interface design work, supporting the many users we unexpectedly had, and even implementing new services, like we got a PR two weeks ago for a new service I hadn't actually built yet. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you.